built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name.
Good morning, church, and welcome to our online service for January the 30th. I'm so happy you've decided to join us and worship with us. I want to remind you to get that worship guide downloaded, either on your iPad or iPhone, or print it up so that you can follow along and get the most out of our worship service time together. We're going to, I'm going to do something a little bit different for the sermon this morning, because I really want to encourage you and to also challenge you as we try to face this recent surge of COVID infections and also the the prospect of us having to reopen and reboot once again here in a week or so. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and we're going to jump right into the sermon. Father, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to pastor your people. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to use the technology that we've been given to be able to meet together, even if it's virtually. We're also thankful that we're going to be back together soon, and I just ask you, Father, to to fill each heart and mind with your Holy Spirit and encouragement as we meet together this morning. Help us to learn the lessons from our past that can help us in the future. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. In our recent college and career class, 
uh, and also our men's Bible study on Wednesday nights and the women's Bible study, we have spent the last month, month and a half discussing, discussing this, the biblical topic of intergenerational discipleship. This is the concept of God's plan for the home and the church to be together generationally, discipling one another. Uh, based upon mutual relationships uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ and with each other. As we move through these lessons, one of the final discussion questions was this. If you could go back in time and give some advice to an older, more mature person in your life at that time, to give them that advice to give to you, what would you want that older, more mature person to have told you as you were going through something? What, what do you wish they had shared with you that you know now? So as I've been working on our, our church's history this past week during my COVID hibernation, I've gotten through about the first 15 years of our history. And I think today, as we get ready to reboot and reopen once again because of COVID, we need our 91-year-old church to give us some advice as we prepare to reboot, reopen, and restart and start back up this mountain once again. And hopefully this morning we'll be wise enough to listen and to learn some lessons from a church at the fork of the Little Mazarn. So here are seven lessons that I think they can teach us after, as, as I've looked at the first 15 years of our history. Number one, we need to preach Jesus. This church today exists because of the proclamation of the gospel. Not only the proclamation of the gospel now, but the proclamation of the gospel 91 years ago. The gospel, the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, his sin-defeating, life-resurrecting, redeeming, atoning sacrifice. The story of his great gospel is, our, is the front door of our church and also our foundation, and it always has been. Our minutes, our written minutes of the particular members' meetings don't begin until September of 1933, but we do know from membership records and oral histories taken down that two preachers decided to come over the mountain from Valley Missionary Baptist Church in Bismarck in September of 1930, in September of 1931, and in September of 1932, the church had an annual week-long revival, a protracted revival, where these preachers came and preached. They also met for Sunday school in the Rush Forks schoolhouse every Sunday uh, as well during that time. And they met with their pastor one Sunday per month. Without going into all the details of all the meetings and all the people that they received, let me just give you the, the bottom line. Because of the preaching of the gospel in this community, conversions happened. Baptisms happened. Jesus' good news preached from the lips of these two preachers birthed a church. By the time that the church moved over to Cam Mahan's property on the Little Mazarn, there was a group of 64 people who had either joined by baptism, letter, or statement. Now, one word about this, because this is really cool. On the membership records that date all the way back to 1930 when the church first began, anytime someone joined by baptism, there would be an abbreviation before that word baptism. It would say EXP. And I was confused. Confused by the abbreviation EXP written by so many names who joined through baptism. It wasn't until on page 51 did I find the explanation of the abbreviation. In the minutes for September 4th, 1938, the clerk Jada Mahan wrote this. The results of the meeting were as follows. Two profession, professions, that is professions of faith, which united by experience and baptism. Again, this reinforces how churches are built. Baptism isn't for anyone that just wants to be baptized. Baptism is for those who have made a declaration of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ personally. They have experienced the new life of the gospel through personal faith in Jesus Christ. So church, let's learn the lesson. Do we want to see Center Fork have a future? Then we need to do what we've always done. We need to preach Jesus and he'll save them. And we will do our best to disciple them. That leads us to the second thing. Because if we're going to preach Jesus, we also need to teach the Bible and make disciples. The church isn't just a place of preaching, but it's also a place of teaching. This fledgling little church 91 years ago set aside time to meet with their pastor once a month. And then also to meet once a week for Sunday school for this important ministry of teaching. For a church to be healthy, you have to faithfully come together for Bible teaching. 
being on the couch at home is, is, is a substitute, but it isn't enough. We need to be together. They met weekly for Sunday school, and once a month on Saturday, they would, and once a month they would meet on Saturday afternoon, have a Saturday worship service, a Saturday teaching service, a Saturday membership meeting, and then on Sunday morning have their Sunday morning service. This phrase is found repeatedly in the opening line of many of their business meetings. Regular preaching days on Saturday afternoon before each second Sunday and each second and fourth Sunday at 11 o'clock. Bible lesson taught by our pastor on second and fourth Saturday night. Dated page, or that's on page 14 of our minutes, April 7th, 1934. So on Saturdays, they would have a preaching service, then they would have business meetings with their pastor, they would have teaching. They met regularly. They assembled. This is what a church does. We live our lives, and we decide to push pause and come out from the world and meet as a body to hear the Word of God taught. When assembled, this church preached and sang and taught the Bible and baptized new believers and received new members. Teaching of the Bible was a vital part of these early days. Uh, just listen to this record from pages 10 and 11 of the minutes. In two successive monthly meetings in November and December, Pastor Thornton taught through Genesis 1 through 11 and then through Genesis chapter 12 through 30. Now, please listen, church. This was in addition to the Saturday service, worship service. Then he taught 11 chapters of the Bible. And then the next week, he preached on Saturday afternoon, evening, and then taught Genesis 12 through 30. And then they had church the next morning with another sermon. This is, this is, this is a healthy church. This is what leads to good, healthy churches. We will preach Jesus. We will teach the Bible. This is what we do. This is, this is our thing, church. We don't need to defend it. We don't need to apologize for it. We need to recognize that God will honor us if we do it faithfully. The third lesson we need to learn from Center Fork of 91 years ago is we need to take membership in the church seriously. From the beginning, we need to make membership meaningful and serious. Being a part of the Lord's church is a serious commitment to follow Jesus with other people. We aren't in a, in a country club with dues. We are a living body of believers. We are a church family. We went through the waters of baptism, and as Romans 6, 4 says, we, we committed to walk in newness of life, not just with Jesus, but with his people in a church, to be with people, like-minded believers who will help us follow Jesus. By April of 1936, just six years into this church's existence, they faced a problem, and here are the exact words from the church minutes. Why aren't our members attending church services? This was a question before the body in that business meeting, so the pastor and the church organized a group of people to, to try to find and locate the sheep. Now, we think we're the first church in the world to deal with the issue of sheep who don't want to identify with the church through regular attendance and regular giving and fellowship and serving and praying and worshiping. But membership in a Baptist church is tied to what we believe about what the word church means. The church must assemble we are called out by the gospel from the world to the Lord Jesus and to one another. We're committed to walk in newness of life. We, we joined a body of the Lord Jesus Christ to follow him, obey him, and serve with his people. And when a member abandons those commitments, that indicates either an unhealthy situation, it indicates an unhealthy or dangerous situation that needs our attention. Now, it's important to note that when they decided to make this decision, and they eventually did have to remove some people for non-attendance, there was some division caused in the body because of this. It's also a cautionary tale for us as we move forward as a church, and we try to locate the sheep and try to do that. We need to be very careful in how we go about exercising our love and, and, and exercising what we would call church discipline or discipleship with struggling believers. Because the people of the church are sheep who belong to Jesus. Pastors and the church as a whole, not just pastors, but pastors and the church as a whole need to exercise love and grace and patience with the Lord's people as we call people to make a genuine commitment to follow Jesus Christ through the Lord's church. But we are called to, as pastors and we are called as a church to make disciples, not just converts. We, we aren't just trying to get a name on a roll. And a disciple is someone who is actively following and obeying Jesus. And the most baseline 
accountability we have is that we assemble together. Now, we, we know that this doesn't apply to people who can't be here because of being sick or for other reasons. We understand that. But for the most part, for most people, church members should be here. Church members should be active, be serving, be worshiping, be giving, be praying. I want you to think back 91 years as they're going through a Great Depression and facing a future world war. I wonder if Center Fork had treated being in a church and church flippantly. I think there would be a very good chance that there wouldn't be a church here today if that were the case. For us to build a faithful, effective, healthy church, we have to have members who understand what membership in the Lord's church is, and they must understand what the church is and why she matters so much, not just for them, but for those who have not heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number four, this church teaches us another lesson. We need to work out our doctrinal issues. On page 23, February 9th, 9th, 1935, we have an interesting event in the minutes. The church recently had purchased a lamp for the building over on Cam Mahan's property, and the church voted to build a cabinet to hold the lamp and other possessions. And then, right after that action, without any explanation or context, we have these words. It was also moved and carried that the church take up a line of foot washing. In other words, the church voted to practice foot washing in a service. Now, there are some Baptists of that time that practiced foot washing as an ordinance of the church alongside baptism and the Lord's Supper. Uh, most of those were hard shell or Calvinistic Baptists or free will Baptists. Uh, but three months later, on May 11th, 1935, foot washing was observed at the end of their Saturday night service after the church partook of the Lord's Supper. However, it was a divisive event because only part of the church attended the ordinance of foot washing. Now, this must have been a divisive issue within the body. In September of that year, Clem Hall was elected as the new pastor. And for the remainder of that year and early 1936, the minutes and the meetings uh, lacked much detail. But the issue of foot washing was eventually addressed June 13th, 1936. See page, you can see page 30 for that in the minutes. And here's what it says. It was moved that foot washing be dropped from the church on account of division. It was voted in, discussed, but was finally decided to pass it up. Now the verbiage is a little hard to follow there. Without trying to overread this statement, the church decided to drop foot washing as an ordinance of the church with this vote. And it isn't mentioned again in our minutes and practiced according to any of our minutes. There are some things in the life of the church that don't change. The gospel, Jesus, and the faith once delivered to the saints. But each church has to decide how they will practice the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper and how to go about having services and handling membership. And in that generation, they had to decide if they believed foot washing was a perpetual command for the church or not. And in my view, they chose biblically and wisely, but they worked it out. It may have taken them a few months, and they did it in unity. Fifthly, I think we can learn from a lesson from our church. If they could speak into our lives right now as we're on the verge of rebooting and trying to get restarted again, they would tell us, hey, observe and obey the ordinances to honor the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus will honor you. Preach the gospel, and when you preach the gospel, practice the ordinance of baptism, Baptize those new converts, and then take the Lord's Supper, and take the Lord's Supper regularly. Early on in the life of the church, they obeyed the Lord Jesus and baptized new believers into the life of the church. You can see this in September of 1933, where the church met for a series of meetings over the course of the week from the 3rd through the 11th. Page 7 of the minute records uh, of the minutes records what transpired. Listen to these words. This is an exact quote. The ordinance of baptism was attended to after sermon by Elder Thornton on the subject of baptism. Charlie Chambers, Minnie Meadows, Sybil Ponder, Lucille Petra, and Opal Mahan were baptized by Elder William Sheffield in the Little Mazarin Creek near the church house. No further business appearing, conference closed. Listen to me, church isn't complicated. The gospel has called us out of this world into fellowship with His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have trusted Him. We have publicly declared that through the waters of baptism as a public testimony of our faith and for entrance into one of His churches. This 
pattern of discipleship worked in the days of Paul. It worked in 1930 and 31 and 33, and the gospel still works today. A little church down by the Little Mazarin Creek was born because they observed the commandments of the Lord. They also observed the Lord's Supper regularly. The first recorded Lord's Supper service was on May 12, 1934. This was after their monthly Saturday afternoon worship preaching service, after the Bible lesson from the pastor, and their regular business meeting. Then they had services the next Sunday morning as well. So number five, observe the ordinances to honor the Lord Jesus, and He will honor you. Six, we need to do what you need to do what you can with what you have. As we try to reboot and restart and revitalize Center Fork Baptist Church, we must not despise the day of small beginnings, Zechariah 4.10. During the Depression era, as they faced an uncertain future with another world war on the horizon, this church did what they could with what they had. They did support their pastor. It wasn't much. The first salary listed was in October of 1933, for, a, for the whole month, his salary was $1.27. The next month was a little bit better, $2.46. But as I, I, I even talked to Bill Westfall's daughter about this whole subject, there were some weeks when he was pastor when he did not receive an offering, that there just wasn't any money to give. And a lot of the pastors, I'm sure, went through that. And I'm sure there was also other, other things that were non-monetary gifts. But look, the church, Center Fork, did what they could with what they had. And even though they couldn't even afford a part-time, uh, a, full, a fully part-time salary, they gave anyway. Uh, early on, they supported their pastor. The church began in October of 1933, supporting the orphanage in Texarkana, Texas, with their second Sunday offering every month. And on June 4th, 1934, they voted to start sending $4 to support the American Baptist Association Mission Fund for Interstate and Foreign Missionaries. We still support that same fund, all of those funds today. And as we consider all that we're able to do for our pastors and staff and our missionaries and other ministries, just consider this. Over 14% of what came in last year to our general treasury went directly to missions uh, when you total it up, it ends up being right around probably 16% of the giving. And I am so grateful to be a part of a church that, that gives to missions, that supports our missionaries, that supports our pastors, and supports our ministries. But listen to me. Someone had to start where they were. Someone had to do what they could with what they had. That's what that church did. We need to relearn this lesson as we move forward as a church and reboot and restart. We can't live out of a past that no longer exists. Listen, the folks who are committed and here are the church we move forward with. We will do what we can with who we have and what we have, and we will not despise the day of small things and small classes and small beginnings because, listen, if we will be faithful in what God gives us and who God gives us, He will be faithful to bless so we need to do what they did. We need to do what we can with what we have. And seven, when the opportunity arrives, we need to be ready to move. This is one of the most exciting things about this little church that had its birth uh, right here in our community and settled right there near, near the Little Mazarin Creek. The church had a name tied to that location. I'm sure that first building was a special building in a special place. The Center Fork Baptist Church at the fork of the Little Mazarin. But by the early 1940s, the community roads were changing. By the mid-40s, the church had a choice to stay put or move with the community. And they could have dug in their heels and ignored the obvious shift in front of them, but they didn't. We need to step up now in the middle of this obvious time of upheaval and do our best, church. Do our best to let our church and more importantly, the gospel and the person of Jesus Christ in the middle at the fork of the road of this community. In the fork of the road of this community so that we can present Jesus to them. This is not a time for us to retreat or to give up or to stop. It is time for us to move forward. Yes, in our culture today, the church is now a minority opinion voice on matters of salvation and on matters of cultural ethics and marriage. Yes, we need to figure out how to better connect with a younger generation so there can be a future here. Yes, this is difficult and it is confusing, but let's learn the lesson that they're trying to teach us. Be ready to move. 
The church shouldn't retreat. We are, we are standing in victory that the Lord Jesus Christ has bought for us by His blood. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. We are not called to retreat. We are called to go and share and, and, and present God, the gospel. And we are to open our mouths and to be testimonies. Let's be center fork with Jesus and his gospel at the center of that fork. It worked in 1945 when they moved from just over there by the creek to where we now presently exist, and it will work in 2022. Wow, what a great string of pearls of wisdom from a church birthed at the fork of the Little Mazarn Creek. Preach Jesus, teach the Bible, take membership seriously, work out doctrinal issues and preserve the unity of the body. Observe the ordinances and obey and honor Jesus. Do what you can with what you have. And when the time is right, be ready to move and keep Jesus at the center of the fork. Finally, I want to leave you with a challenge, church. The church born right here in our community speaks to us even today. I mean, just, just try to imagine the echoes of their voices singing over there in the 30s. Uh, imagine a lone voice of a Bible preacher proclaiming the word of God. Imagine going down to the creek and, 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 and seeing the splash of the waters of baptism and the amen of the congregation as that person would come up out of that water. And their legacy is teaching us. Now the question for us is what shall we do now? Who shall we become? What will become of Center Fork Baptist Church? 91 years from now, will the example that you set and that I set shine as a light for our grandchildren to follow? Or will our example be one that has to be discarded because we acted so faithfully, faithlessly, selfishly, and foolishly in a time of trouble? And only time will tell. But there's only one way to find out. Let's move together. Let's move forward together and build a church together. Listen, Jesus has given us his promises. He's made his promises. He keeps his promises. Church, it is time for you and for me to keep our promises to him and to each other for his glory, for our good, and for those who need him. And for those who need Jesus and need this church down here, by the fort to keep on preaching and teaching Jesus. Have a great Sunday. Please use this time to, to go over these notes and reinforce what you've learned today. I'm so encouraged that we have these voices of examples from 91 years ago, right from our own minute books to teach us the way forward as we try to reboot coming out of this COVID isolation in just hopefully another week. Have a great day and I will see you soon, church.